Great. All right. Well, we will get started. So um, I'd like to welcome you all to the uh, seminar series for the Department of the Classics and Religion at the University of Calgary. My name is Marika Cassis, and I'm the head of the department. So I will just take a moment and start with our land acknowledgement. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy comprised in the Siksika, Pekani, and Kainai First Nations, as well as the Sutina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. Uh, the city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Uh, so just a couple of quick housekeeping matters. Um, I'm so delighted to see people here and I'm so delighted to see people from all over the world. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, just to note that this is being recorded and we'd ask that everyone keep themselves muted throughout Dr. Halden's talk uh, in order to minimize feedback. Um, at the end of the talk, questions can be submitted in the chat or by pressing the raise hand button. And um, Courtney uh, Canavay and I will do our best to make sure we can see who's asking questions at what time. Um, so without further ado, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce you to, to introduce to you Dr. John Halden, who is the Shelby Cullum Davis 30 Professor of European History Emeritus and Professor of Byzantine History and Hellenic Studies Emeritus at Princeton University. He's currently Director of the Princeton Climate Change and History Research Initiative and Director of the Program in Medieval Studies Environmental History Lab. He's also president of the International Association of Byzantine Studies and is a corresponding fellow of the Austrian Academy of Sciences, a member of the Archaeological Institute of America and the British Institute at Ankara. His research focuses on the history of the medieval Eastern Roman Empire in the period from the 7th to the 12th centuries on state systems and structures across the European and Islamic worlds from late, uh, late, late ancient to early modern times on the impact of environmental stress and societal resilience in pre-modern social systems, and on the production, distribution, and consumption of resources in the late ancient and medieval world. As many of you will know, he is a prolific researcher and has published extensively in all of these fields. Among his most recent works are two important studies, Archaeology and Urban Settlement in Late Roman and Byzantine Anatolia, Yukaida Avkat Eozu, and its environment, right here, um, I think I have your entire library in behind me. Uh, and A Tale of Two Saints, The Passions and Miracles of Saints Theodore the Recruit and the General, uh, which is Oxford University Press. His work is fundamental to those of us working in late Roman and Byzantine Anatolia, and I've been so grateful personally for his, own, for his help with my own work over the years. So I will now ask John to talk to you about St. Theodore, Eukaida, and Anatolia, 500 to 1000 CE, Landscape, Climate, and the Survival of an Empire. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed, Marika. And I'm um, so pleased to see so many of you here uh, this, well, it's, I was gonna say this evening, but it's this afternoon for you, I guess. Um, uh, I'm gonna talk, it's interesting that Marika mentioned a couple of books there which uh, are relevant to today's talk because I'm gonna talk a little bit about Anatolia. I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, environmental history. I'm gonna talk a little bit about our site at Efkait or Avkat, modern Bey Ozu. Um, uh, and I'm going to try and tie them together in a general story, a narrative about what happens to the East Roman Empire in that period of crisis from the middle of the 7th to the middle of the of the 8th century. So let me just share my screen. Am I co-host? Can I do this? You should be able to, Courtney. Is John yes, able? yes. I, yeah. Go ahead, John. There we go. Okay. Can you all see that? You're good. Yeah. Okay. So that's my title slide. Um, so the first thing to say is nobody doubts that um, <clears throat> climate, environment and social development are linked in causally complex ways. But the problem is finding out the mechanics which link these different elements and trying to determine the causal associations um, or uh, assigning these different causal relationships some order of priority. And to do this, we have to ask about questions of scale, um, both chronologically and spatially. Um, we look at the relations between the levels at which climate and environment and history are observed uh, and so forth. Just to give you a, a rather crude illustration at a meeting we had back in 2013 when we first, lo first launched our um, climate change and history initiative. One of the paleo scientists who works, on, who is basically a geologist, 
was talking about a, a crisis that occurred uh, in the 8th millennium BCE. And one of the historians asked how long the crisis was, and the answer was 450 years or thereabouts, at which point all the historians fell about laughing because as far as we're concerned, civilizations come and go in 450 years. Um, and it's certainly, you know, our crises are a year or two or three years uh, or a century. So scale is important and we need to know what level, uh, what degree of scale we're talking about. And then we need to be able to differentiate um, uh, between the effects of say a climate event or an environmental event on a complex society. How does, how does this event affect different parts of the society? And what happens when those different parts of the society uh, act upon their um, sort of um, uh, linked elements within the same social system? So there are a lot of complex issues which are both methodological and the um, uh, th um, theoretical, which we, we need, need to, to think about. And what I'm going to try and do today is, is give a, um, a little uh, exemplification of how we might um, uh, proceed by linking social history, political history, environmental and paleo history, archaeology and paleo science together. Um, in, a, in a recent discussion, let me just make sure my slide is, hold on. Right, there we go. In a recent um, publication, 2016, um, um, uh, Buntian and some other colleagues uh, presented what they were calling the late antique little ice age. Um, um, you can see the first page of the article there uh, and there's a chart that they drew up towards the end of the of the of the article and what they wanted to do there was show how uh, a range of patterns which were evident in climate in the period from um, the beginning of the sixth to the um, beginning of the eighth centuries uh, seemed to tally at least uh, coincided with a number of significant uh, changes in both Eastern and Western Eurasia in terms of um, systems failing, civilizations breaking apart and reforming, um, the spread of pandemic disease in the form of the Justinianic plague and so forth. And they were very careful, it has to be said, they said it several times in the article, that, that we're not positing here a direct link, we merely point to these um, uh, um, correlations and suggest that there may be some causal connections there and it's up to historians and archaeologists to look more carefully at what's going on to see if there is indeed a connection. Unfortunately whenever you publish a chart like this people who don't understand the science or indeed the history will jump on it and say oh look uh, the Turks arrived in the Black Sea that was caused by heavy rainfall or whatever. I've even seen a headline saying Attila the Hun caused by drought. This sort of nonsense. So we need to be very careful about uh, both what we say um, uh, our environmental data can tell us and also how we how we present it. So I don't see any reason to doubt that there are causal relationships, but finding out what they are and what the mechanics of them are is much more complex. Uh, and it's never a single one-to-one um, -one relationship. So one way into such issues um, uh, and that's what we're going to do today, is to look at uh, regions, micro-regions, sub-micro-regions, look at things on the ground at a very local level um, uh, and try and get lots of case studies and examples together and then build out from that basis to aggregate them and, and develop general patterns. And so our project at Efkaita uh, fits into that sort of jigsaw and uh, that's what we have been trying to do uh, since we began it in 2007. Um, and Anatolia is particularly important because it was obviously, as you all know, for several centuries, the heart of the uh, medieval East Roman or Byzantine Empire. And understanding how its climate and environment impacted uh, on that state and on the people who lived in the state and on its economy is obviously very important. But it's really only in the last 20 years, and to some extent, in, in some respects, only in the last 10 or 15 years, that we've had the, uh, the science and the precision from certain types of paleo science to be able to make more, um, more refined causal connections between history, archaeology and paleo environments. And in fact, the Anatolian case, although I'm not going to go into the details now, challenges quite a lot of assumptions over several millennia about the relationship which is often assumed between climate change and uh, society, civilizational collapse and so forth. So how did the conditions 
of the later 7th and 8th centuries um, uh, in Anatolia impact upon the ways in which the East Roman Empire survived. Uh, and the question's important because if we just look at a couple of maps, so there's the, the Roman Empire in the 6th century after Justinian's reconquests, and there's the Roman Empire uh, 140 years later. So it's really a rump of its former self, as you can see, broke it up in, in the West into a large number of small principalities and duchies and territories linked by a few land corridors and primarily by sea. And then in the East, the heartland of the, of the East Roman Empire um, uh, upon which it has to rebuild. But if you consider that the empire lost at least three quarters of its territory and probably more of its income uh, in a period of about 15 years between 635 or 634, and 645 to 650, you'll realize what a colossal task the empire faced. And in fact, I challenge you to think of any state that would have survived under normal circumstances, such a catastrophic loss of land and resources. So let's have a little bit of a look at Anatolia to see uh, um, uh, in more detail how the case uh, uh, um, uh, of the impact of environment and climate uh, um, on the East Roman Empire can help us understand what was going on. Um, um, before you keep going, we have a real quick question from the chat. You'd mentioned to go ahead and pop in with questions here. Absolutely. Um, would you be able to repeat the name of the journal article? Uh, yeah, well, I can go back and show you it. There you go. It's in, it's in Nature Geoscience. Cooling and societal change during the late antique Little Ice Age, as they called it, the Lalia, as it's now popularly known. Wonderful, Combined thank you. Okay. Yes, thank you. There's another comment, but we'll let you continue on for, for a couple more moments here. Okay. So the question is, how does the empire go from, from this? Starting here, we end up with this. Uh, the empire survives, and it eventually turns into the paramount uh, maritime and land power in the East Mediterranean for a, a century or so, uh, or a little bit longer, between 900 and, and 1030, 1040, 1050. Um, so we've got some interesting things to explain here. Can understanding environmental history offer some guidance? And the short answer is it can, uh, if we uh, deploy the information we have carefully. So um, the climate uh, regime across Anatolia from the third and second centuries BCE into the late second century CE was quite stable, warm and um, humid, uh, conducive to um, uh, agriculture. It's often referred to as the uh, RWP, the Roman Warm Period. It was characterized by, by conditions that minimized much of the usual risk and decadal variability associated with Mediterranean climate. And it's been associated for obvious reasons with the rise and consolidation of the Roman Empire. Now, I was about to say, as is well known, but I've got to go back a moment. Uh, so um, we have this empire. This is the situation in the, in the middle of the 11th century. Uh, in trying to think about um, uh, why the empire survived, um, I wanted to look at five key aspects, and I've just put them up on the screen there, uh, to find out which of these, if any, was, uh, had priority in, in, in the causal chain. Did they all have an equal role to play? Did they play equally important roles, but at different moments in the history of the empire? And so we have its geographical and geopolitical situation, the, the ideological context, um, its organizational and administrative structures, the relationship between elites, the state and ordinary populations, and then the environmental context. And factors. Now I'm going to I'm going to talk mostly. I will talk about the others briefly, but I'm going to talk mostly about number five. Uh, now Anatolia is subject to three um, global systems. Uh, there's the North Atlantic system, the Siberian high pressure system, and the subtropical system. And they're both influenced by the monsoonal system out of the Indian Ocean. Uh, and that gives, because of its uh, very varied landscape as well, with the plateau in the center mountains uh, to the north, east and west and south, and then different um, uh, um, types of coastal plain on the north and west and south in particular. It gives this, this um, the impact of these um, climate systems means that the um, internal um, uh, climatic structure of Anatolia is extraordinarily 
varied um, uh, ac across the uh, subcontinent. Um, you can see this in the pattern of rainfall, for example. Uh, if you look at the different peaks in annual rainfall, you can see how varied it is. Um, in particular, if you look at the May peak, the central plateau, um, or the, the, the sort of central and eastern part of the central plateau, um, has a very different rainfall regime from many other parts, particularly from the west. And if you look at the temperature charts across the seasons, um, with spring, uh, summer, autumn and winter, again you can see very considerable variations. Nothing that you probably wouldn't expect if you know about the Anatolian landscape, but of course these are going to have significant impacts on uh, agriculture, on the economy and therefore on society uh, more generally. Now one of the interesting things um, about um, uh, Anatolia right now is that we, we're getting more and better paleoclimatic and paleo-environmental information um, from a range of sites all across uh, the, um, uh, Anatolia. Um, and it means we, we're beginning to be able to say a lot more about the climate of particular areas. And uh, this is a chart uh, which we've used before to demonstrate this. It's a very simplified chart, but it gives you some idea of uh, the sort of evidence we're using. Um, so this chart shows right at the bottom we've put in that sort of bar, bar graph, that, that is historical evidence um, um, quantified for um, uh, uh, seasonal variations. And then we've got evidence particularly from two uh, lake beds in Cappadocia, Lake Snar and Tejer. Um, and what they show in particular is uh, an important change um, first of all, in the middle of the 6th century, from relatively uh, dry conditions to relatively humid conditions, back again to relatively dry in the middle of the 8th century, and then um, slightly more humid uh, uh, the early 10th, middle of the 10th centuries. And that's important because those changes both coincide importantly in some respects with changes we can see in society and politics, but in other respects, they don't coincide at all. And I'll come on to why in a moment. Uh, that's just a chart I've thrown in quickly. Uh, that's based, that's a, a chart drawn up based entirely on textual references from Greek, Latin, Arabic, Syriac, and Armenian sources about um, climatic um, uh, um, uh, events noted in contemporary uh, histories, hagiographies, and so forth from the um, sixth and up to the uh, um, ninth century. They're, they're not all that reliable because of course they're subject to observational bias. Many of them are um, described by people who didn't experience them but heard about them from somebody else um, and so they can't be used as a first um, uh, base for evidence but they can be used to support uh, other conclusions based on more reliable material and it is interesting that the that cold spell which you can see marked in blue, beginning in the 570s and ending in the 730s, more or less coincides with the change to um, uh, a more humid um, climate as outlined in some of the pollen data, uh, in some of the um, uh, climate data rather. Uh, let me change the slide, oops. <clears throat> Um, one of the interesting things that we now know about uh, agriculture in Anatolia are these very dramatic shifts in uh, productivity for a range of crops. And you can see here uh, we've got um, going from left to right, north, central, northwest and southwest Anatolia for three different types of um, uh, uh, crop cereals, primarily wheat and barley, grazing crops, different types of grasses and then tree crops, i.e. fruits, down at the bottom. And one of the interesting things you'll see is that um, in Northwest, let me just get my, whoops, let's go back a minute. Sorry, I seem to be messing things up here. Excuse me while I sort this out. <clears throat> 
So I'm just going to close my PowerPoint down. I've got a, um, my computer's telling me I've got a internet problem. So I'm going to shut that down for a second and then restart it. Right. Everyone see that? Yep. yep. Okay, sorry about that. Seem to have a an internet issue. my my chart gone <clears throat> all right something's happened to my powerpoint never mind we'll skim over that but we can still talk um one of the things that we see first of all is um beginning in the middle of the sixth century uh, um, a fairly clear decline in productivity across the board um, but it can't be tied in directly to something like, like the Justinianic plague because where we have detailed evidence, it doesn't begin in the 560s or 550s or 540s, it begins after the year 600. Some of the chronology for the pollen data and for the environmental data is very, very broad. So we have a plus or minus 10, 15 or even 20 years in, in most cases. But we do have some very precise data. Uh, which I'll come on to in a, in a moment. But one of the things that the data do show is, first of all, an overall decline across the board. But then in certain areas, um, uh, both a proportional increase in certain crops, particularly cereal crops and crops related to livestock breeding. Um, uh, but, an, uh, but, but these uh, are not a sort of across the board development. Um, the sites where these phenomena can be detected uh, are often not far away from sites where nothing much changes. So the same regime, agri agrarian regime, uh, continues as before. Uh, so uh, although some of the changes might um, in one or two instances coincide with apparent shifts in climate, nearly all of them don't. So there are other reasons uh, for, for these changes. And the question is to find out what, uh, what those reasons are. Um, let me just go back a moment. I think when I changed my PowerPoint, I may have changed to the wrong one. So let me just put this back up. John, we've also okay. lost sight of you. <laughs> have you? Yes. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll put myself back up in a moment, I hope. Sorry about this. I don't know why we're having such technical fun today, but we are. There's always days there like that. So let me see if I can get myself back up again. Can you see me now? No. Okay, 
I don't know what's going on here. My computer is really acting up. Um, oh, I do apologize. Oh, oh. Courtney says she can see you now. So, yep. I think you can carry on. Okay. All right, I'll carry on for now. Um, so that um, uh, slide I just showed you, if I can go back. That slide shows you different parts of Asia Minor with different um, shifts. The red, um, the, the, the sites marked in red um, are sites where there is more or less um, complete continuity. So the crop pattern, um, the relationship between cereals and fruits and, um, and livestock doesn't seem to change. The other sites, those which are marked in black from across Asia Minor, show that there's a shift towards more herding, more livestock rearing, more cereals. Um, and what's interesting is that that um, uh, uh, shift uh, doesn't necessarily coincide with uh, climatic factors, as I just said, but it does coincide with very important changes in the Imperial Fiscal Administration. And it suggests that uh, what we have is um, not a government response to uh, the climate, because of course they weren't aware of that sort of thing, um, but rather um, uh, a government attempt to increase the amount of um, uh, resources uh, it collected in grain and livestock for its armies and for Constantinople in particular, which happens to coincide with uh, a more humid climate in Anatolia and thus um, uh, accidentally benefits the empire in its struggle uh, to survive. Um, and that's quite an important point. And we can see that, uh, and that's where I want to just move across here. And we can see that in shifts in uh, technical terminology in our sources, um, where uh, the word which used to mean um, a, a forced purchase of goods starts meaning an annual uh, collection of a regular tax, um, but in grain. Um, uh, the word which was used to mean um, uh, a trade tax um, uh, starts being used to mean um, uh, a land tax. And uh, the word for a warehouse or storehouse, apotheki, uh, starts to be used also to mean uh, a granary. So all these are indications. There are other indications as well, which I, I don't need to go into. But the crucial point is that the shift in um, productivity patterns across Asia Minor uh, is matched by changes in fiscal administrative structures um, as well. And there are a few other points here which are important, um, uh, which reinforce this case. Firstly, if you think back to the map of the empire at the beginning of the 8th century, you'll recall that it's lost control over key sources of grain. And those, of course, were um, uh, Egypt, uh, North Africa. Um, this is up until the 620s. Um, Sicily, of course. Um, uh, the Southern Balkan regions, uh, particularly in Thrace. Um, Bithynia, Northwest Asia Minor. Um, and Paphlagonia and the Pontic regions. Now, what's interesting is that um, Paphlagonia and the Pontic re re regions um, uh, don't come on stream, as it were, as far as we can tell, as important sources of grain until after the sixth century. Um, by the same token, while the empire did continue to have access to um, uh, North Africa for a while, up to the towards the end of the seventh century, and it continued to have access to Sicily for a while, um, these were very insecure sources of supply because of Arab sea power. Um, Thrace was too badly damaged by barbarian incursions and inroads and disruption, uh, and so the empire had to rely on much more local resources. Um, and this is where Efkaita or Afkat comes in later on. And the, uh, the, the, the evidence for uh, Paphlagonia and Pontus and for Bithynia strongly suggests that these are now the new sources of grain um, for Constantinople on the one hand, as well as for the local military in Asia Minor on the other. Uh, now, again, the fact that um, uh, the military play a role here is significant because if you look at the distribution, and these numbers are 
they're not entirely hypothetical, but they're not secure. So these numbers reflect the number of soldiers we're fairly sure were based in the original field armies that made up these military provinces um, after the middle of the seventh century in Asia Minor. Um, they're probably changed by a few thousand in, in a downwards direction. But the crucial point is that the smallest army uh, was allocated to the largest territory. This is the um, so-called Armeniakon army, which is the, used to be the former army of the master of soldiers for the Armenian provinces, which was on the Persian frontier in the, in the South Caucasus. Uh, and as you can see there, we put 12,000 in. Um, uh, it's probably not entirely inaccurate because we can base this on figures we have from the fifth and sixth centuries for the uh, size of those forces. Um, so the, uh, the, the reason for these differences appears to be um, uh, the proportional uh, um, uh, effect of the, of the new arrivals, the soldiers on the countryside that can support them. And it's noticeable that the 12,000 soldiers of this particular army are in the poorest provinces of Asia Minor. The richest provinces are in the west and in the south. Um, so where you've got 12 to 15,000 and 25,000, they're the rich provinces of the west, the west coast and the area around Constantinople. Um, and the, the 15,000 in the middle, uh, that's the so-called Anatolicon region, which includes a large chunk of the um, Central Asia Minor plateau, um, which is a breadbasket today, uh, and which certainly could produce substantial amounts of wheat in ancient and medieval times, but far less than uh, it can today with modern agriculture and fertilizers. So we have a number of things going on. We have a climate that certainly favors wheat production. It's slightly more humid. We have um, shifts in the pattern of agriculture based on the pollen evidence we have for land use, which suggests that there's a move towards uh, more grain production and more livestock rearing. We have evidence from our texts for uh, shifts in the administration of the fiscal system towards uh, greater emphasis on uh, cereals. Um, and we have evidence indirect, admittedly, for the ways in which the armies are distributed across um, Anatolia for a relationship between numbers of soldiers to be maintained and the wealth or relative wealth of the provinces which are to maintain them. Um, I've got no idea why I put that slide in at all, um, so we'll skip over that very quickly uh, and move on to uh, our site, X marks the spot, um, the modern village of um, uh, Beozu. It used to be called Avkat, which is taken from uh, the Greek word Efhaita. Um, there you can see from the main road running west to east, um, uh, the little village of Beozo, you can just see the minaret of the mosque. Um, the village nestles in that little sort of uh, fold in the hills there um, in front of the so-called Afkata. And then where the Byzantine fortress was, uh, it's, it didn't have a name before we started working there. We asked them what they called the hill. They just called, they said, we call it Tepe Tepe, which is hill hill. Um, but we called it Kale Tepe because we, as you'll see, found a, the remains of a Byzantine fortress up there. The hill, for those of you interested in the prehistoric period, the hill to the right, uh, let me just move my cursor, this, oops, sorry. This hill here um, is a Bronze Age um, uh, uh, prominence. It's actually higher than the, where the Byzantine fortress was. Uh, and when we did our preliminary explorations, we actually found a temple platform there, uh, but we weren't allowed by the local authorities to uh, do any further explorations because our permit didn't include that hill. Um, as Marika will no doubt tell you, the Turks are very um, diligent about what you can and can't do um, uh, on, on a site for which you have a permit. At any rate, what's interesting about the site, just at first glance, is it's pretty well concealed. If you, if you imagine that there was no minaret there and the houses were all quite small uh, stone houses, um, you wouldn't really see them from, uh, from, from the main road running west-east. Uh, Evkaita became the centre of the cult of St. Theodore. And here you see St. Theodore the recruit, St. Theodore Tiro, on the left, and his grown-up brother, who was invented in the ninth century, St. Theodore the General, he got promoted. This happens to a number of soldier saints, incidentally, 
um, uh, there are there's a, a junior soldier saint who's usually a martyr um, from the second or third uh, centuries. Uh, and then in the ninth century, the Byzantine aristocracy wants saints who sort of match their social status and esteem. And so a number of saints get promoted to generals. And there is a Saint Andrew the general, there's a Saint George the general, of course, and there are several other Saint Mercurius, I think, became a general as well. Uh, and this is the inscription, it's a very nice inscription put up by the Emperor Anastasius, probably around about 510, which tells us when Efchaita, which had just been in a, a sort of um, a rural centre, um, important for the cult of Saint Theodore, but not for much else, um, uh, was turned into, officially turned into a city. And there's a very nice inscription um, edited by Cyril Mango and uh, Ihor Shevchenko back in the 1960s. Um, but as you see from the, from the stone, it's still there. It's now in front of the town hall um, uh, in Mechtezu, which is the, the town nearest to our site. Um, uh, population about um, uh, 7,000, I think now, um, which is about three kilometers away. Now, um, Efkaita had a wall supposedly built by Anastasius, but there's some evidence from texts that it actually existed before Anastasius. And we found some traces of that wall and you can see some elements there. Um, uh, interestingly, we weren't quite sure where to look to begin with, because although there's an obvious line um, where the wall might have been, um, uh, we didn't have enough uh, points, uh, reference points, uh, without excavating to make sure. Uh, so we actually used a US Marine Corps um, tactical um, command uh, uh, module software, which predicts where to put defenses if you're building um, a defensible position. And it actually quite accurately predict, predicted the best place to put a wall. And when we followed and walked that line, lo and behold, we found large bits of Byzantine masonry. So if, if the US Marine Corps is good for anything, it's good for archeology. span um, We also found um, what we thought would be, uh, was likely to be the Church of St. Theodore. We know it's outside the walls um, and that uh, this item here, if I can show you with my cursor, you can see my cursor, right? Um, is there. Yeah. Um, and um, when we did a super intensive survey, um, we were fairly sure that we had um, uh, a reasonably sized basilical church. Super intensive survey, for those of you who haven't been on an uh, archaeological survey or excavation before, is where you um, actually uh, multiply the number of people, uh, field walkers collecting or counting sherds by about 10 and have them effectively shoulder to shoulder, crawling across a field in this case. Um, hot and uncomfortable work. So we gave it to the undergraduate students, of course. Um, they did enjoy themselves. Um, but uh, the point is they, what they were able to show was that there's an enormous density and concentration of roof tiles, which is in a basilical shape suggesting it's where the roof caved in um, before the masonry walls were carted off by the local population to build their houses and, and other structures with. Um, in a, in a, in a mid-19th century traveler's account, um, um, a German traveler says that this, this area was absolutely covered in half-standing buildings. Um, and some of the older people in the village said before the Second World War, there were lots and lots of ruins there, but then locals um, sort of um, people came along, including businesses looking for decent cut stone and dressed stone and carted huge amounts of it off. So it's now spread all over the countryside. We found several houses in Mechtezu, which is three kilometers away, clearly built of Roman or Byzantine dressed stone. And we also found a lot of epigraphic evidence built into people's houses uh, where things had been carted off. So unfortunately we arrived two generations or three generations too late to really find um, a, a good um, uh, evidential basis for reconstructing the spread and shape uh, of Efkaita. But we were able through surface survey and geosurvey work to actually um, ascertain quite a lot about the, um, the, the city. Um, so that's what we think was probably the Church of St. Theodore. Here's some examples, bits of um, 
um, uh, chancel screen. Um, uh, uh, in the bottom there, a large chunk of um, aggregate, which was almost certainly part of a floor. Um, lots of tile. Again, I can show you lots and lots of images of bits and pieces. Uh, when one puts it all together, it's pretty persuasive that we actually have a fairly substantial concentration of, of buildings. And the Church of St. Theodore was surrounded by a sort of hostelry and almshouses, and there was an annual fair there, so it must have been quite important. Um, the area marked in red on the screen, I'm sorry, I'm looking, I'm not looking at you, I'm looking at my screen because I've got two screens here and for some reason my first screen's packed up so I can't, can't see much on it. But the area, um, the area marked out in red, uh, uh, although you can't really see it from, from, from this angle, is actually a very, uh, that's the Calais Terrapin, it's quite a high promontory, right, uh, towering above uh, and looking down upon the village. Uh, we did quite a lot of um, um, uh, georadar survey and um, uh, magnetometry survey work, and the georadar um, uh, uh, showed us basically this, um, a very substantial walled structure. It looks a bit like a keep, except there are no corner towers, um, but in front of it, um, a, a high amplitude anomaly, which is almost certainly the foundations of a substantial wall. Um, to the south, if you can just make out the shape of this, it's basically triangular. Uh, this is a relatively low slope away from the walls, but this is cliff all the way around here. It's pretty sheer cliff. It would be very, very hard uh, to climb it. Um, so it's actually quite well defended by the natural situation it's in. And that explains why the evidence of defences really only runs from here all the way around to here. This is a tractor road, which is actually, it looks like it's on the same level, but it's about 40 or 50 feet below, uh, which you can drive up to get to the top. So we have a, a defensive emplacement, we think here, uh, various unidentified buildings. Don't forget, we weren't allowed to excavate. We were only allowed to survey. This is the magnetometry, which shows a different set of anomalies and structures, possibly even from a different period, but very clearly marked there, we have the basis for a substantial defensive wall with an outer ditch and possibly a second outer ditch and some other features which only excavation can properly identify. Now, what's interesting about Ifhaita um, is that the, the normal ceramic picture uh, for um, small uh, provincial centers and even some larger provincial centers um, in Anatolia um, during this period, mid 7th to um, late 9th or early 10th centuries, is one of very considerable retrenchment in the seventh, uh, later 7th and 8th and early 9th, um, with very little activity extramurally, uh, with a general shrinkage of the occupied area, but with some suburbs carrying on. So, for example, at Ephesus, it used to be thought that the whole city retired to um, uh, a defensible situation um, using reuse spoilia. spoilia. Uh, it's now clear for the most recent work that actually, although that's true in, in one sense, there was a defensible center set up. Nevertheless, several isolated suburbs uh, next to the outer walls of the city and on the outside continue to operate as inhabited areas with small scale economic activity going on. Presumably, if an enemy appeared, the people would, would rapidly um, leave and get inside the walls. But what's interesting at Efkaita is, firstly, the walls aren't particularly, um, uh, were never particularly impressive. Um, we know, for example, that um, uh, the walls were um, uh, captured quite easily by the Arabs in a raid in the 660s. Um, uh, in fact, the city was occupied and, and uh, um, uh, sacked uh, before being abandoned again. Um, uh, and when one looks at the general situation of the city, it's not particularly defensible because it's got a hill behind it, uh, which gives relatively easy access above the defense. Um, uh, so it's, it's really not a terribly well defended place. And yet, um, if you look on the, the, uh, the map here, you can see that there's Efkaita, that's the modern shape of the occupied area. But ceramically, and I'll leave that to one side for now, in terms of ceramics, from the late Roman period on, you'll notice that these areas which are 
several hundred meters away from uh, Efkaita, in some cases uh, a kilometer or so, continue to be occupied and sometimes even expand through the Middle Byzantine period. Um, things change when you get into the, uh, to, when the arrival of the Seljuks um, and um, Danish Mendids. But if you look at that Middle Byzantine situation, um, you have both the fortress, marked Fruri on there in red, but also a number of uh, areas outside which are probably not industrial, they may be rural industrial installations, but farm farming centres of some sort. And this is really, at the moment, uh, at least, because we don't have all the survey evidence we'd like, but at the moment this is, seems to be quite unusual. And one explanation might simply be that because this is the center of a grain producing region, which, uh, even back in ancient times, Strabo describes it as very productive in terms of wheat. Uh, and Strabo comes from the next valley along at Amasia, which is about, um, let me think, probably about four hours um, by, by hoof or foot um, to the east. Uh, even Strabo says this is a rich, produce, a rich wheat producing area. And with the different conditions of the seventh and eighth centuries I've described, plus the demand for grain from the imperial government, one wonders whether in fact, this unusual continuity and expansion of activity outside the walls of the city isn't a, isn't a reflection of that. Uh, there, I wanted to compare it with uh, Chadu, uh, with which you're all intimately familiar. Um, uh, uh, you can see Amasya there, well, Afkat is a little bit uh, to, the, to the left of that. So we're not all that far to the north of Chadahoyuk. Um, and there's a picture of the, of the, the tent hill itself. Uh, but the difference here is, and Marika will correct me if I'm wrong, is that the, um, in Chadha, the, the classic sort of um, dark age scenario does indeed prevail, that there is this dip, certainly in the ceramic picture, between the sixth and the 10th, and then a visible recovery and expansion in the 10th century into the 11th century. Um, and Efkaita seems to be very different um, uh, from that perspective. Um, I was going to do some uh, numismatics, but I don't think we've got time for that. Uh, but Efkaita uh, has the same numismatic profile as everywhere else. In other words, there's hardly any coins. In fact, here we have no coins from the 8th and 9th centuries. We have lots from the 6th and lots from the 10th and a few from the 7th. Uh, I think that's the same at Chadha, if I, if I remember correctly. It's not unusual. Um, and there, there's back to the original, the original um, uh, um, landscape. And I think I wanted to compare Efkaita then also with Amasya. You can see this is a massive rock. Um, we have Mithridatic tombs built into one side, the, eastern, uh, the western side. Um, you can just see the river uh, running through the middle of the town and there's a Turkish fortress on top, but there are Byzantine remains up there as well. It's quite a rough climb, um, but there's Byzantine, there's a Byzantine fortress there. Efkaita, according to some scholars, was the capital of the, um, the local military province. But when you compare Efkaita with Amasya, which is only four hours um, march away, um, I think that can't be right. This is where you want to put your soldiers and your fortress. Uh, and I'm, I'm just showing that to give you an example of the rather, uh, um, uh, poor nature of our site. Um, the reason why Efkaita is important, therefore, is because it wasn't important, in a sense. It's, it's an ordinary, small provincial town. It was famous because it was the site of the Centre for the Cult of St. Theodore. Uh, uh, it, it, it became important uh, for local strategic reasons in the 7th and 8th centuries to do with wheat production. And then, interestingly, after the uh, late 9th century, when the frontier advances again, um, the, the Arab Byzantine frontier advances away from, from this area, Efkaita really drops back into relative insignificance. Its, uh, it's uh, only importance is that it's um, um, a metropolitan bishopric. Uh, so it's important in the church hierarchy, but it seems to lose any economic significance and certainly has no further military significance for the empire um, uh, by that time. Um, I wanted to say a little bit about some of the paleo-historical research we've done, because from, uh, from, from Lake Na in Cappadocia, um, we have some very accurate annually dated valves uh, or, or, or layers, if you like, from cores taken from the lake bed, full of pollen. And these are the pollens that give us most information about local land, 
land use and landscape change. And the interesting thing about these is because we can date them to the year, we know that in um, 678, uh, in 662, uh, there's a sudden dramatic collapse in agrarian output. All the evidence of anthropogenic crops almost disappears and it continues to get smaller all the way through to 678 until it stops completely. Um, and then you get evidence for the growth of weeds, which colonize former agricultural land and an increase in um, forestation. In other words, um, uh, the areas around Lake Nar um, uh, seem to have suffered a dramatic collapse, both in terms of demographics and in terms of human activity. Why that's important is because Lake Nar um, is actually the center of a very wide catchment area. At the bottom of that, on that chart, you can see nearly two and a half million um, square meters, uh, which is about half of Cappadocia. Um, so uh, uh, the evidence from Lake Nar um, is relevant to a lot of Cappadocia in this period, suggesting the impact of the uh, Arab Islamic invasions. Um, it's also important because those dates, which we derived just from the carbon-14 and other dating techniques from the lake bed materials, tie in exactly with evidence in Byzantine, Arab, Syriac and Armenian chronicles for an Arab occupation of that area in those years. Um, so this is clearly nothing to do with, and there's no evidence for any climate impact on society at this time. This is clearly the impact of warfare. It's the first concrete example we've got of what uh, regular warfare can do to the economy of a region. And I think it's very, um, it's very graphic. Uh, I'll leave the technicalities aside because we don't need to, to go into them. Um, uh, but the crucial point is here, and because the evidence from Lake Nar firstly shows that you've got this um, uh, breakdown in human activity um, uh, in the late seventh century, nothing much happens until you get to the middle of the 10th century, and then you get a resurgence of human um, uh, um, uh, agriculture. Uh, and that coincides with the recolonization of the area by Byzantine elites. And we have some good textual evidence for that. Um, it also coincides with an, a slight amelioration in climatic conditions. Um, so again, we can't say that the climate caused the uh, return of of uh, anthropogenic uh, activity uh, in this region, but it certainly probably played a favoring and supporting role. Uh, and I think I should probably stop there. So thank you very much and apologies for the technical um, hitches earlier. I'll try and get my screen to, to get back to where I want it to be. Ah, we can see you again, excellent. Yeah. <laughs> you can, okay. Yep, if you so, want to, Stop sharing, John, then I think we can uh, open I'll it up. I'll try, but for, for, some, for some reason it um, says, okay, I'm going to close that program. About those. Oh, there you are. So, uh, can you us, John. Great. <laughs> can you hear Thanks. me okay? Yep. Yep. Okay. Thank right, you. Sorry about that. I don't know why. Uh, my, my, uh, actually, it's really the first time ever I've had problems with, uh, with Zoom. So I, I can't really blame Calgary. So I guess something wrong with my uh, with my <laughs> technology at this end. Anyway, um, feel free to throw questions and raise discussion points. But it, it, you know, I mean, your computer may have just decided it's time to go to bed. It is, you know, what time in England? So, all right. Um, I have several questions in the chat uh, from Christian that I'm just going to go back to the first one and start with. Um, it says this is perhaps a bit outside of the scope of the time span, but a related question. Was perhaps some of the interest that Byzantium had in the Cataponate of Longobardia, Italia in the 10th and 11th century, partly driven by desire for additional grain source. I've been focusing on, the, focusing on this era recently and knowing the region personally, I've wondered if that's what one of the major draws were. Agriculture seems to be the reason given sources at academic discussion. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting question. Um, uh, I can't give you um, a, a very clear answer um, but I can say this. Firstly, my colleagues, um, um, uh, Adam Izdebski uh, and um, um, Jörg Lutterbacher have done a lot of work on the um, pollen data from uh, South Italy and Sicily for the period from the sixth up to the um, 14th centuries. Um, and what I know for certain is that the, um, uh, the climate in Sicily 
becomes distinctly more arid in the course of the eighth century. And what I can't remember is when it becomes less arid, but I think it's the late 11th century. Uh, and I'd need to get the charts out, which uh, are somewhere on the file on this computer, and I'm hesitant to tamper with things <laughs> now back to, to normal. Um, but uh, it may well be the case that interest in Sicily was um, uh, um, spurred on by economic concerns. Um, it certainly seems to be the case that the East Roman Empire um, was less interested in dealing with the, um, the Arabs in Sicily than you might otherwise think it should have been in the course of the ninth century. Um, I mean, the, the, um, the Moorish or, or uh, North African conquest of uh, Sicily took virtually the whole century from the 820s up to 900. I think Bari falls in 899, it's more or less the last stronghold. Um, uh, not Bari, um, Paloma. And um, what's, what, 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 uh, what one wants to know is why, if Sicily was so strategically important, which it seems to be, was so little effort made to actually do anything about it, particularly in view of the fact that the empire, unlike in the, in the seventh century or the eighth century, was not as deeply uh, enmeshed in warfare in either the north or the east um, uh, in, the, in the ninth century. It could easily have spared the resources one would have thought to do more about it. So is the lack of interest simply because Sicily is no longer so important economically, given this aridity and the presumable, um, uh, the, the, the pollen data shows a fairly clear tailing off of, of, of wheat output. But of course, this has to be tied into other factors as well. It may be to do with shifts in local markets, which we can't see from the pollen data, and it may be to do with pressures to produce different sorts of crops. Um, which don't show up in the pollen data in the same way. Um, but it, it, would perfectly, it would be a perfectly good question to ask of the palynologists uh, and the climatologists, what's going on in Sicily in that respect in the 11th century? And do we see any particular shifts and changes in both pattern of production on the one hand and in the overall climatic situation uh, in the other? I'm fairly sure the answer, there is an answer can be given even though it would have to be a fairly sketchy one at the moment. Thank you. And a follow-up question from Christian again. What is the reason for the gap in coins at Ifkata? Um, do we think it was abandoned during the wars or was it having issues due to the climate or both? Um, the absence of coins is almost certainly to do with imperial minting policy. In other words, in the 660s, the empire decides to um, direct its um, uh, um, petty coinage output to major cities only, and they tend not to reach um, either the rural hinterlands or those cities which no longer have a major economic role to play, uh, because coins are absent from virtually everywhere except Constantinople. Very few coins are found, um, mm -hmm. uh, and where they are found, they seem to be tied into military activity, mm -hmm. because we also know that the, the government consigned coin in, in bags, weighted and marked and sealed uh, under guard to pay the troops at regular intervals. Um, uh, normally soldiers are paid uh, in gold um, uh, in, the, in the late Roman period, not in bronze. Um, but when the empire was hard pressed economically, it increasingly pays soldiers in bronze. Um, and where we find large amounts of bronze, uh, we're fairly sure that we've got um, substantial numbers of soldiers. Um, uh, the problem is that there are places throughout Asia Minor where we know there were soldiers in the texts and we still find no coins. Um, so clearly the soldiers are being paid primarily in kind rather than in coin. Right. Uh, Scott. Hi, uh, thank you very much for your talk. It's absolutely brilliant to hear you speak. And I, I'm just I'm a big fan and admire you. Um, I have a question about the fortress walls actually around the site that you've done the survey. And I'm wondering, given that the the that you see the construction kind of on the on the one side where the slopes are not so steep, um, but do you find that the wall itself um, 
uh, differentiates in thickness in its construction along the slope. So I say like mm -hmm. one side, like as you get more say towards the south side of the wall, is it narrowing or getting thicker or vice versa? So um, the problem for us was that um, the, um, as, as you remember from the, from the, um, uh, the aerial photograph and the, um, uh, the geo radar, that wall crosses a sort of promontory to cut the, the triangular island of the hill off from the rest of that, from the rest of the um, land beyond it to the, to the north. Um, the trouble is that because the slope on each side is very steep, um, uh, the wall and quite a lot of the surface have been eroded away and sort of it's, it's all been washed down into the valley below. Um, so in fact, when you scramble down, or in my case, fall down, um, when trying to scramble down um, uh, into the bottom to see what's there, there's a lot of cut stone and huge amounts of rubble and tile, which clearly were once part of this wall. But it means that we can't see uh, how the wall ended. Did it end in a big bastion? Did it end in a... Um, uh, was, there, was there a turn around to, to follow a line around the hillside at all? We've got no idea. All we've got are the, um, uh, the, the, the there's a basically a mound about six or seven feet high, overgrown with soil, turf um, and, and some shrubs, which runs across with gaps in it where there must have been a gate because we've also got evidence of bastions on either side. So you can make out quite a lot with the naked eye and you can see a lot more through the geo radar and the uh, magnetometry, um, uh, but at the moment we're not in a position to say whether the wall is thicker or thinner at any given point. Uh, by eye, it all looks to be the same. Okay. That might not be true. Great, thank you very much. Questions? <clears throat> just Can I just ask Scott why he wanted to know about the <laughs> thickness of the wall? It's an interesting question. Um, well, one, I actually, I work with Dr. Cassis at Chatterhoyek. Uh, my thesis, my current MA thesis is based on the site. And right. so I'm doing some uh, surveys of different uh, sites about fortifications and how these fortifications are constructed and the space within and the space outside of it. And so I was kind of mm -hmm. curious about that because where ours is has about a, I think it's about a two meter thick component to it, but that's on more on the eastern side running from mm. south to north and then on the side where I've worked on the site there really isn't a very thick wall and I'm just kind of curious if this is a trend in terms of construction and how some of these fortifications are built. Yeah well if, if we had any archaeology uh, proper i.e. I sort of you know stratification or dating we might be able to say more because we don't know when this wall was built. Um, it has to be said, I can tell you now, I didn't tell you earlier, but we don't really know when these structures were put up because we've got no dating, except that we have vast amounts of late Roman and early Byzantine roof tiles. So we know it's, it's sort of late Roman or early Byzantine, uh, but some of it could be later Byzantine. Obviously the site was no longer fortified after the Seljuk or Danish mended occupation of the region in the, probably the sort of early 1070s as far as we can tell. Um, but um, so we've got we've got crude dating criteria to go by. Uh, we've also got regular pots from the from the fortress area which tie in with that. Um, we've got some Constantinople whiteware which is early 8th century uh, for example and has come obviously a long way so we've got evidence of some long distance commercial activity. Um, somewhere in that area, there must have been a bishop's palace of some sort, uh, apart from a commandant's um, um, sort of tower or some sort of keep or, or uh, structure of that sort on the, on the hilltop. Uh, so there's loads more work to be done. Unfortunately, the current situation in Turkey prohibits any sort of applications for permits um, from the likes of us uh, <laughs> at the moment. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, that was an interesting question. I mean, the, 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 the thickness of our wall, again, by eye, it looks to have been about three meters thick. Okay. Um, uh, uh, that's regular all the way across. The bastion walls are certainly the, the front wall of one of the bastions was fairly clearly revealed when we did some heavy cleaning. Uh, <laughs> and that's at least three meters thick. 
Um, and at the very bottom, the original outer stonework survived. And so you can see the rubble fill. Um, so we have some indications there, but there's no indication from what we had of period. And as you know, dating Byzantine fortifications is really, really difficult anyway. Yeah. Um, without a lot of other criteria to work with. Yeah. Uh, a lot of other data to work with. One of the things I'm interested in is actually how the, um, some of these settlements are actually described in literary sources. So when, when the sources are used in Castra and, and Polis and so, so on and so forth, I'm trying to kind of look at the sources and what cities are describing here and what kind of terminology they're using. And it's, it's just interesting that you, you have this kind of variation in size with places that have certain fortifications around it, yet they're using different terminologies to describe these regions and these cities or even the towns themselves. So I was just kind of curious um, what your thoughts also were on, on how you would like um, identify or how they identify these kind of regions based on the fortifications. Yeah, uh, unfortunately it turns out, I remember when I, was a, when I was a grad student and I thought that one could differentiate by reading the sources between towns and fortresses by the language they use. Um, uh, I was very quickly disillusioned because in fact, you find plenty of texts which describe a large fortress as a polis and other texts which describe a town as a castron. Um, uh, so often the terms don't mean anything other than it's got walls. Um, uh, the other thing to bear in mind is who is writing the text or what was the text written for. Um, so a text that's about somewhere from where the writer might come or have an interest in will tend to sort of big up the place in question. So it could be a, a dump in the middle of Anatolia, but if the author comes from there, he'll say it's a polis, yeah. uh, because that's, that's, you know, it's civilized and it's important. Um, and uh, if, if the author comes from Constantinople, they say we went through some dumpy little village, uh, et cetera. So, so the authorial perspective and the reason the text was written in the form it was written all have to play a role, as you know. Um, but it does mean that Castron polis don't help much. Uh, and also, again, um, you know, people, uh, certainly we know where you have these so-called cities and islands, which is an Italian phenomenon, but you can find it in Anatolia as well, where you have a, an, an ancient city, quite extensive, which breaks down into a core defended cit citadel area with, with the city sort of around it. Uh, and then a number of connected but separate suburbs which used to be part of the original walled city. Each of those connected suburbs has a church and each of those suburbs works in a way like a village but they're all claiming to be a city and they all call themselves the same city even though they're different parts of the place. Um, and so the terminology can become very confusing uh, because of the ideological overlays which, uh, which determine how a writer uses the words. Sorry, that's rather depressing, I suppose, because it's, <laughs> it's fine. Not really Thank helpful. you very much. It, it reminds me of Scott will have experienced this too. Every time we come through customs in Turkey, right? We, the, they get our research permits and they say, Yozgat. Oh, but yeah, when we get to Yozgat, these are major cities. <laughs> yeah. But the, you know, the, the sort of elite Turks in, in Constantinople or in Istanbul are like, why would you go there? So it's, uh, yeah, yeah, it's the, the, the same thing holds true now. Uh, James has a question. Thank you. Um, I just, well, my first question is just to clarify, and it serves as a preface for my next question. Did you say that the walls at the site are three meters thick? At the base, yeah. Okay. And well, it, they may be. I mean, we, we didn't excavate, so we don't know, but the rubble, at one place, we have the fr clear, what's clearly the front face, the outer face of the wall, and if you measure back from there to what appears to be the rear face of the wall, um, it's just under three meters. I Whether see. the whole wall is like that all the way along, I couldn't say, but it's probable. All right, well then just maybe building on the probability of the consistent thickness at three mm. meters, is that common for similar sites? Would walls usually, three meters seems very thick and you know, understandably so, but I'm just wondering if that's, common for other sites, if it's common for that period, but um, uh, not common for other periods? This, how, how does it compare to other similar sites? So the walls at Amorium, which is obviously a major fortress town, are two and a half meters 
um, and the, the bastion bases are four meters. Um, but the bastions at the base are mostly solid fill, so it's very hard to know whether they really count as as a measurable wall as such. It's more like a foundation level. Mm. Um, the thing to bear in mind with Efkaita is that the if if the sources, the written sources, are correct, these walls were built uh, used with the patronage of the emperor Anastasius, and emperors wanted fine-looking walls. Mm. rather than sort of something some, something that would just do the job um, and it well may be that um, these walls uh, are quite inappropriate for the the town itself but mm. they are appropriate to an imperial foundation which is what Evkaita counted as and there are other examples where uh, the state or the government step in and an emperor puts their name up in an inscription uh, on or near the walls the inscription that we have at Mechidazu that I showed you um, it was originally um, uh, on the gate, apparently, um, but obviously was picked up and moved to the local um, um, uh, provincial capital mm. later. So I, I hesitate to, to pronounce. The person who would be best um, qualified to talk about this if Marika uh, asks him to give a talk would be Jim Crow, who is uh, by far the most specialised a scholar I know on Bizni fortifications currently working and especially in Turkey. He's also very good on water management so you could get him to talk about aqueducts and water supply but but um, I think these walls uh, and were probably if they were imperial that's why they're thicker than the average provincial town mm -hmm. unless Efkaita had much more ideological symbolic significance than even we currently think it had. Um, but then the other thing to bear in mind is that the walls, um, by the time we get to the Persian sack of the city in the sometime around about 618 or 619, the walls were clearly of no use whatsoever because the Persians just marched straight in. They weren't defended. Now, whether that's because there was no defense and you could lock the gates, but you couldn't stop them being knocked down or some other reason, it's, it's hard to say. Um, the walls were almost certainly rebuilt um, and the fortress would have been built for the first time because there was definitely no fortress before um, before the Persian uh, attacks in the early 7th century. Um, the walls uh, of the fortress and the hill were fortified probably during the reign of Constance II, possibly during one of his big campaigns eastwards in the 650s uh, or early 660s. Mm -hmm. And so if we, and that's the, the date we've hazarded for these walls, again, on no evidence other than my hunch, um, uh, uh, in the book. All right, well, thank you, thank you. Well, I'll take this opportunity to ask a, a quick question. The, the um, numbers that you presented for the number of soldiers in the provinces, uh, where, are, where are those numbers, like where do they come from? Uh, the, the immediate source of those numbers is my book, uh, 1999 yes. book on the, yeah. so the sources um, the sources um, it's a combination of material first of all the notita dictatum uh, for the east um, uh, the, the size of the various field armies uh, secondly statistics offered by plausible and implausible by uh, particularly by 6th century writers like uh, Procopius, Agathias, Theophylact mm -hmm. one or two others um, when you put these together uh, when you also look at things like that text, the Strategicon of Morris, which describes a Balkan field army um, for the year uh, between 590 and 600 or thereabouts, and gives you some 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 figures for the size of the different divisions. Um, uh, if you put all those together and sort of do a bit of adding and, and subtracting and, and so forth to take into account historical circumstances, troop transfers, movements around the empire and so forth, you can you come up with those sorts of numbers. Um, now, uh, I would say uh, that you have to, I would say at least 5,000 plus or minus in both directions for any of those military forces. So where it says 15, it could be just 10, but it might be more than 15. Where it says 25, it could be 15 or 20, but it probably wouldn't be more than 25,000 and so forth. Uh, we know there's a high rate of attrition 
And we know in the end, by the time you get to the ninth century, um, Arab geographers give these notional numbers for the for the thematic armies. And the, the biggest one is 15,000, which is Anatolikon. And the rest are all between uh, 10 and 8 and 4 and so forth. So it's guesswork, but it's sort of reasonably, well, I hope it's reasonably intelligent guesswork. Um, and then, of course, the other thing is that that's the initial size of those armies, they probably very quickly um, degrade um, and lose a lot of that manpower as they become settled and distributed across the countryside. And into the 10th and 11th centuries, are they local soldiers or are they still being brought in? Because we, Scott and I argue about this a lot because of the, the lack of coinage at our site. And I mean, if they're coming from outside, there's so little evidence for payment. And I, yeah, so I wonder about this. Well, there may not be any soldiers in your side at all. Yeah. Um, there's there's no reason. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, because somewhere has defences doesn't mean it's actually garrisoned or manned by troops. And then the other thing is we know there's some slight evidence, a German colleague, a um, uh, uh, grad student, in fact, of mine in, in Mainz is working on this right now. Um, there is some evidence from the Balkans and from Anatolia that um, many towns or communities had um, a numerous uh, or numeron in Greek, uh, which doesn't seem to be the proper professional military unit. It seems to be a, a group of um, bigwigs in town who may not have been very big uh, at all by Constantinopolitan standards, local uh, uh, sort of top people and their retinues who made up a sort of local military. But it's basically a sort of mafia boss and their gang, basically, rather than um, proper military force. We see them, we've got a couple of seals, um, one for a region in Paphlagonia, um, which is based around a small town, uh, but it's a corporate seal. It's a seal issued for the, for the whole body of the numerum. And the same for the, for the example, which comes from, um, uh, somewhere in the Balkans. I can't remember where now. Oh, from Dyrrhachium. Um, so, so there is some evidence that towns had their own local militia, which has nothing to do with the Imperial Army at all. And it was presumably paid for and funded on a volunteer basis. Um, so you wouldn't have any Imperial coinage being sent uh, to support it, firstly. And then the second thing is to go back to the bigger question, what was the army in Asia Minor like in, in the 1030s, 1040s? Well, the thing to bear in mind here is that from the 950s on, the government had gradually been commuting military service for money so it could pay mercenaries. Uh, mercenaries are professionals. They're much more efficient than sort of a militia, you know, National Guard type army. Um, and uh, you don't need so many of them. Uh, in fact, you can't afford as many of them as you could of your own soldiers but the quality is higher when they're loyal. Um, and so um, uh, the, the soldiers who would have been fighting with um, uh, Romanos IV in the 10, late 1060s and early 1070s, 50% uh, of them were mercenaries. Uh, they could be Byzantine mercenaries. Hmm. They, they might be local, but they were still professional soldiers. Yeah. And then the, the what was left of the so-called thematic armies uh, was a sort of, semi-professional, not a complete uh, ragtag as, as portrayed by some of the contemporaries like um, Ataliatis, for example, who has a, a particular mission to, 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 to point some of these flaws out. Um, but the, lo the local sort of military was really pretty degraded by then and, and um, could be effective when well led, but didn't have to be. Uh, and I've argued, in fact, that we, we massively underestimate Byzantine military efficiency right up to the 1060s, when if you actually compare uh, campaigning and battles won and lost up to the 1060s, Byzantine army didn't do any worse in the 11th century than it had been doing in the 10th century. It's just that we see all the great victories in the 10th century and the recovery of lost territories that we don't necessarily see in the middle of the 11th. And then I've also argued that um, Roman Oster IV himself was actually a really good military commander, but he was in, uh, very um, intemperate and, and uh, a little bit um, colic, choleric. So uh, he didn't have a good sort of um, relationship with his 
with his soldiers. That's a different set of questions we're getting into here. But anyway, that's the that's the the answer. Thank you. All right, I see one more question from Scott. All right, thanks. So yes, me and Marika have a we have quite the discussion about military presence and so on and so forth. Um, but I'm one thing I'd be interested to get your thoughts on because this is something I'm kind of curious about is where you're talking about the climate and the difference in terms of the environment. Do you, is there evidence of showing that being that on the plateau, there's a lot of livestock happening and being raised. Do you mm -hmm. notice a difference or is there any evidence of it, of particular types of livestock being raised in particular regions? So say hypothetically around where we work at Chatter, could this be a region where they're prominently raising beasts of burden? Or is there like, you know, mm -hmm. regions where they're doing more kind of a, cattle for feeding armies that are passing by where they pick up the cattle coming through on the main military roads and so on and so forth. Uh, so mostly, mostly you wouldn't be eating beef, you'd be eating sh sh uh, mutton. Um, so so uh, cattle would be primarily beasts of burden or milk. Um, and when they got old then leather and, and horn and, and glue and stuff. Um, uh, it doesn't mean that people didn't eat beef, they certainly did, but, but the, comp, the, the sort of main meat food would have been sheep, uh, mutton, um, uh, and possibly goat. But, you know, when you look at the um, archaeofaunal remains and so forth, every site seems to be slightly different from every other. I recently read some of the Chadder stuff on that, and it looks like you, you seem to have an increase in, in goat um, uh, towards the end of the yes. occupation. Yeah. Um, 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 and, and goats are supposedly the poor man's beef cattle. But whether that's really true or just a sort of Western European, North American prejudice, um, I think is, 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 is a question worth asking. We don't have anything like that from Efkaita, of course. Other sites, Amorium and some of the sites in Southern Asia Minor where excavations have taken place, the balance between mutton and sometimes pig um, and, and, um, and goat seems to be generally in favor of mutton and uh, sheep and goat. Um, not much evidence of poultry, which is interesting, although they're always popping up in saints lives and so forth. Um, and, and cattle are generally referred to in terms of oxen um, or for milk. Um, and when you read saints lives, which talk about people with big herds of animals, they're always horses, sheep and goats not cattle. Again, doesn't mean to say that cattle weren't bred because we know they were and they are referred to. Um, uh, there may be, if we had better archaeology and more data, there may be a change across the centuries from one to another, according to the area, which gets to your question. Were people being asked to provide particular types of animal in the same way that they were possibly being asked to increase the amount of wheat they paid in tax or in lieu of tax. Um, it's, it's really hard to know. I mean, in theory, the answer should be, well, probably, but we've got no examples of that. Um, uh, what we do have um, is evidence that there were substantial imperial estates which were devoted to horse breeding. One of them was in Cappadocia, we know that. One of them is near is, 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 close, is in northern Phrygia, we know that. When you look at these estates, um, uh, when you look at the list of late Roman estates, and we, we know quite a lot about them um, and how they were managed, they're all over Asia Minor. And the question is whether they survive or not. There used to be a theory, Michael Hendy um, supported it, and I, I didn't like it and I still don't support it. Warren Treadgold argued it quite strongly that the early themes were deliberately set up uh, and that the soldiers were settled on old imperial estates and given land. Um, and that's where all the imperial estates went. But it doesn't really work when you follow them through and look at this, you know, how the imperial estates um, come through into the 11th century and the 12th century when we have more evidence. It's not a very, it's not very persuasive. Thank you. And um, one more question from Christian. 
Hi, Dr. Alden. I uh, wanted to ask you a question that's actually really related to what Scott was asking. Um, and it kind of goes more back to the, the sources that we have, um, you know, because I know a lot of your work, uh, you know, from some of the um, you know, some of the presentations you've given in the past, you know, we're really focused on this, the scientific, um, you know, the, and the archaeological um, evidence that's there. But I was wondering about, for example, like if you look at like Constantine VII's Geoponica, um, or you look at the Suda or some of the law books like the Ecloga and the Procuros Nomos, um, are those like, have, has there been any like look into any kind of Byzantine Anatolian agricultural um, I guess, processes that were of value to perhaps someone who was living in that area? Is there anything that survives that we know of that writes down um, any of these practices? It would be nice if there were. Um, the, so we have some, um, as you probably know, there are, in the 11th and 12th centuries, there are um, a number of fiscal treatises um, uh, which describe different qualities of land and what they can be expected to produce in terms of uh, fiscal return or tax revenue, but they don't specify where these are. There is one treatise, however, which does note uh, that parts of the Balkans, parts of Asia Minor um, uh, have X quality land, you know, good, medium or bad quality land. Um, I can't remember the reference offhand, but I can dig it out. And I think it's in, um, we refer to it in chapter five, of the Efkaita volume, which is in front of Marika now. Um, unfortunately, you're not in the same room, so she can't pass it round and you can check it out. Um, <laughs> I'll have to collect the, it. <laughs> the, it, it. Towards the end of Peter Bikoulis's chapter, um, uh, we, we go into a sort of a model of what sort of agricultural production might have been going on around Efkaita, what the carrying capacity of the landscape might have been, using both contemporary uh, evidence for the use of the land in that region today and in the Ottoman period uh, and, and using Byzantine sources as far as they can be uh, used for that. Uh, and it, that, that those sources talk about value of land, quality of land in different parts of the empire. Um, but to go back to your question, the only, what I would like would be if we actually had um, region specific uh, texts which talk about a particular area. And unfortunately we don't really have that. The farmer's law, for example, uh, which is now um, uh, uh, re-edited and, and um, translated into English by, um, uh, by Humphrey, um, is, um, uh, uh, is supposed to be uh, representative of um, village communities in Asia Minor, but there's no indication in the text that that's the case. It could be in right. the Balkans, or it could be, uh, there's actually a fairly persuasive argument that it's originally from southern Italy or Sicily. Um, yes, I heard that. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, what what that um, what that farmer's law does give you, though, is an idea of the crops that were grown and the animals that were bred, uh, and that, in in the broadest sense, give you some limits. Um, uh, you know, but it doesn't really help you differentiate between the South Balkans, most of Anatolia, uh, the Aegean Islands, uh, and southern Italy. So really, it does it doesn't help very much. Yeah, it's the same issue as the geoponica because it's basically a compilation of older materials that mm. you know don't really it, it i mean there's that introduction that really talks about constantinople but then after that it's just a compilation so it's hard to yeah. tell what it actually means in the grand scheme yeah when you when you get a little bit uh, later when you get into the 12th and especially the 13th 14th centuries in um northern greece um using the monastic archives you get a lot more information there about crops grown um, and how much was grown, what a peasant family possessed, uh, what the structure of the family unit was and what the structure of their livestock was in terms of poultry, um, pork, um, uh, um, uh, you know, four-legged animals and so forth. Uh, lots of information there. But of course, that's only for northern Greece and um, um, uh, that region around Mount Athos. Mm. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. If there are <laughs> any other questions, just going once, going twice, <laughs> let John <laughs> let John have a pint and or go to bed. I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm gonna I'm gonna have a large bourbon now. <laughs> yeah, okay, fair enough. <laughs> All right, well, if you'll all join me in thanking John for a fabulous talk. Thank you everyone for the questions. 
And I'm sorry it was, um, if I can just in, inter, in, interject, I'm sorry the technology failed in the middle because um, I had planned to give a little bit more explanatory information about how we use the pollen data. Um, but once my whole system began playing up, it became impossible to follow it through. But um, I get the impression that I did make some sense at the end, which is good. <laughs> you definitely made sense. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon for the seminar and uh, everybody have a safe and good weekend. And thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you for coming.